Okay, good morning. Welcome here. My name is, is Jeff. For those that don't know me, um, one of the pastors here at Grace Evergreen, and just grateful to be able to open up the Word of God with you this morning. I love doing that. I love that we get to gather and worship Jesus here in this space in our, in our community. We get to keep doing it each week, and so I love that. So we're going to continue with our series in the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, uh, or it's on an app, or whatever it is, I would encourage you to find your way there. So Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 12 to 21 this morning. And one of the things that, I, that we're going to see in this passage is kind of this overarching theme that we're going to be looking at this morning. is this, this idea of, of pressing on, this idea of, of just striving forward, of uh, persevering. And as I, was, as I was writing this, and I was thinking about just the idea of us pressing on and, and why we, we press on. For whatever reason, I had this, this, uh, this phrase, uh, always fresh, in my, in my head. And now, if you remember, this was the slogan at, at Tim Hortons um, a number of years ago. Do you guys remember that? It was like, the, it was always fresh. Now, I don't know why they chose that. Uh, Tim Hortons is rarely fresh, but they, 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 for whatever reason, they were trying to rebrand themselves, and they called themselves always fresh. And so, now, it wasn't because I was craving coffee or donuts or whatever it is um, while I was writing it, but I was thinking of this idea of, 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 of striving and pressing forward so as to not, not grow stale, right? So I was thinking, it was the idea of not being stale is what I was thinking about. So anybody ever eaten anything that was really stale before? You ate it and it's like, whoa, what in the world, yeah? I, a few years ago, I remember grabbing a, a bag of chips from my mother-in-law's pantry, now, the, 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 you know, the first clue should have been that my mother-in-law had chips in her pantry. Uh, she, she, rarely, she never buys chips for herself. She only buys them when she has company over and does stuff. And then she puts them in her pantry. And I think there they sit for a long time. And so I was hungry. We were at her place for a while, and I wanted some chips. And so I grabbed a bag of chips, and I went and sat down on the couch. And I took a few bites of these. And look, I, I, they were horrible. They were so bad. I never knew chips could go bad. Did you know chips can go bad? Like, they don't have enough time to go bad in our house, so, like, they, they don't last very long anyway, but these were horrible, awful, awful. Things that are stale are not good. You know, being stale can ruin the best of things. You know, food, obviously, we know goes bad really quickly, but the same can be true with our relationship with, with Jesus. It can grow stale. If we're not growing, if we're not striving and persevering and, and doing uh, and just in working at, at knowing him more and, and uh, getting to know Jesus more, think we can get stale in that relationship. So in our passage today, we're going we're gonna to see, we're going to hear Paul encouraging the church just to keep pressing on, to keep pushing forward, striving forward. He doesn't want them to stop. He doesn't want them to go stale. And as followers of Jesus, this should be what we want too. So this letter, it's not just for the church in Philippi. It wasn't just written for that. And we've talked about this before. When we open up God's word, this is for us today. And I love it because it's relevant for us today. So it's important for us to see that. So I'm going to kind of give away, if you're a point person or a note taker, these are the three kind of points that I want to talk about this morning. There's three things that I see Paul calling us to do that we're going to look at in this passage, and that is striving, imitating, and waiting. So three things that he's calling us to do. So let's listen to our passage, and as we follow along, you can follow along on the screens or in your Bible or in your app. I want you to to look for these three points that we're going to hit. So striving, imitating, and waiting. So let's listen to our passage, and then then we'll continue from there. Reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many 
of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Okay, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that it's, it's relevant for us today, that it is here for us. I just pray that through your spirit you would, you would teach us, that we would just hear what you have for us today, that we would leave here rejoicing in what you have done for us, striving and pressing on. Amen. So we're going to start, we're going to kind of break this up into a, a few different chunks. So this first one we're going to look at, first few verses, we'll look at verses 12 to 16. I'm going to read it for us again, so it's on the top of our mind. It says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, Paul says, but I, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained, attained. So like, there's so much in this passage this morning, and all the verses that we're looking at, and I'm likely going to go over it too fast for some of you. Maybe as you heard it, you're like, oh, I really want to hear what it's going to talk about when it comes to this passage, and I might not dive into it as much as you would hope because there's so much in here, but there are a few things that I really think are important that I want to talk about or I want to see. So one of the first things that I don't want us to miss in verse 12 is this word that we see on the very beginning. It says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. The word obtained. Do you see that in the passage? On this if you are a Bible highlighter or underliner, you can underline it or highlight it or mark it up. Paul says he hasn't obtained this yet. Now, a closer translation from, from Greek would be this word actually received. So Paul is saying, I haven't received this yet. I haven't been, been given this yet. So what he's talking about is this, this, is, this, this is perfection. This is, this is fully knowing God. This is what, what he's, he's saying here. When it's interesting is Paul describes it, though, as something... This is knowing God that he hasn't, hasn't received yet or hasn't obtained yet. And it's, it's, it's a reminder to us that, that this perfection, that this knowing God isn't something that we earn. And this is key here because Paul, as he's done throughout this letter so far, is, is just reminding us of, of the gospel. One of the greatest things about the gospel when we, we hear the gospel is that salvation isn't something that we earn. It's something that we receive. It's a gift. It's a gift because of what Jesus has done for us. And that is such good news. So right at the very beginning, Paul uses this word, I haven't received this yet, but I'm pressing on. I'm, I'm working toward it. He reminds us that the salvation is something that we receive. And it's a, it's a gift. And he also says in verse 12 that, that Christ made me his own. Do you see that in other translations? Say he, had, he took hold of me. I love it because there's this, this really concise and accurate statement of Paul's conversion. Jesus said, said Paul, or yeah, Jesus took hold of Paul. He made him his own. That's, that's Paul's, Paul's story. That's his conversion. This is what, what Jesus did for him. But it's not just Paul's story. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's, that's your story too, right? We can say that too because Jesus made us his own. He took hold of us. And so I think at the very beginning of this passage and that we're looking at in verse 12, it just sets the tone for this whole passage that we're going to look at. It just, at the very beginning, we see this reminder that it's all about Jesus. It's all about what Jesus has done for us, and Paul wants to do that. So let's, let's dive in even, even more and see what it has to say. 
Right away, the first thing that we can see in this passage as we look at it, if you remember, if you were here last week, there's this continuation from what Paul talked about last week. When Paul says in verse 12 that I haven't, you guys, I haven't obtained this yet. I, don't, I haven't received this yet. What he's talking about is he's talking about something he mentioned last, uh, in the last chunk in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 10, is this idea of, of knowing Jesus. He's talking about knowing Jesus. This is what he said he wanted in verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10 for you. Again, I'll actually I'll maybe even read verse 9. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Then in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This is what Paul wanted. He wanted to know Jesus. And so in verse 12, he says, I haven't, I'm not there yet. I haven't obtained this yet. This perfection only comes when, when Jesus returns. So I'm not there yet. But... Do you see that? Verse 12, he comes back and he says, I haven't obtained this yet, but, and he said, I love that he has a but in the sentence, but I, I still press on. And this is the first thing that we want to bring out. The first point is this idea of, of striving, of, of pressing forward. Paul admits that he hasn't arrived yet. Now, as a, as a leader in the early church, one of the, the, the churches that he has, has planted, he has, done, he has planted churches and done so much to advance the gospel. He's done all these things. And Paul is quick to point out that, you guys, I've done all that. You may look at me and think I've done all this stuff, but I've got work to do. I, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to keep pressing on. We, we mentioned this last week, but there's this idea still that keeps coming up. That in, in, our, in our life as followers of Jesus, that we never reach a point where we can say that we've made it. Where we can sit back and we can relax because we've made it spiritually. We've reached the pinnacle. Right? We get to that point where we know Jesus. Now we can just relax and everything just becomes easy. That doesn't happen on this side of heaven, right? We, we keep growing deeper in our love for the Savior. We keep striving to know him more. And so Paul knows that. So he's telling the Philippian church where he's at, that I, yeah, I'm, I'm pressing on. I haven't obtained this yet, so I'm going to keep working at it. The church may have looked up to Paul, but in, just in humility, he tells them, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to keep pressing on. And we just see in here just the contrast, don't we, of of where Paul is now and where he was. The contrast. He mentioned this in, in uh, chapter 3, verse, verse 6, of, of where he was. He was talking about some of the, the things that he was before he met Jesus. He's listing off all these things. He was a Pharisee. And then he says in verse 6, as, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. See, in his old life, he considered himself blameless. He considered himself, I've reached this point already. I've reached perfection. I'm doing it all. But now he's like, no, I'm not there yet. I thought I had it all. I thought I, I, thought I was following everything. I was following the law. I was but I, was, I had everything wrong. I'm not there yet, but I'm pressing on. I'm working at this. So we see this contrast. Before he met Jesus, he considered himself blameless. But now he admits he's not. He also, even by saying this, even just corrects any kind of misunderstanding there was, there might have been in that time regarding, you know, perfectionism or, or legalism. And hopefully his words brought hope. See, he's identifying with them as fellow believers. He doesn't want them to think that he's somehow a, a superhuman or a super. Christian, he's superior, but no, he's, he's striving alongside with them. So he, in this passage that we're looking at, these first few verses, uh, there's three times that Paul talks about how he's still working at this. He says uh, in verse 12 and 14, he, he says that he's, that he's pressing on. In verse 13, he says he's, he's straining forward. We just get this image that Paul wants the church to know that the Christian life isn't supposed to get stale. It's supposed to just keep pressing on. But this isn't always easy to do. 
Is it? Like, I, we, can, we, can, we can talk about it, our, our desire, and we can, we can preach about it, how we just need to keep pressing on, we need to keep doing it. But it's not always easy. There are times in our, in our life where we just, sometimes we get lazy, we get maybe complacent, we let things slide for a bit. We get complacent at following Jesus, and we need, when that happens, we need to be reminded of the gospel. And again, this is what Paul is doing, and he's doing this throughout this letter, over and over, just reminding the church of the gospel, of what Jesus has done. So this is what, what we do as, as a church, as Grace Evergreen, when we gather on a Sunday morning, when we gather in times like this, when we gather during the week, in midweek, in, in gospel community groups. We remind each other of the gospel. So you don't ever want to move past the gospel. We want to keep it at the center of all that we do because we know what can happen and we don't. Because we can forget it. And when you forget the gospel, we can grow stale. We can get complacent. We can get lazy in our faith. Another thing that may stop us from pressing forward, from striving on is, is maybe our past. When we think about what we have done, we think about that there's maybe the sins that we've committed, there's this shame and the guilt that we have for our past. But even still within this, in, in the midst of this, we're still called to press on, to, to move forward. And you can say, Jeff, man, like, you don't know my past. You don't know the things that I've done. And I, you're right, I don't. I don't know it. But look at Paul's past. Look, look what he did. He talks about that. And he says this in verse 13, but I, I, one thing I do, I, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies behind. So even with a, a messed up past, like as a believer, we still need to strive forward. <clears throat> in a couple of Paul's other letters, he, he talks in a similar way about this kind of a thing, but he uses the, the image of a race, of running in a race. And even in these words, I, you know, we get this image of it, this, 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 this picture of it. And there's this, a run, if you're running in a race, it, it involves, you know, I'm not a runner, as you can probably tell, but uh, it, it involves forgetting and, and straining, as Paul tells us. And, and if, you know, I know some of you are runners, it's essential for running a good race that you, you, you don't look over your shoulder, right? You don't get distracted by what's behind you. That, you, know, you, could, you could stumble, you could lose momentum. And so you, you know, as a good runner, even as, as in spiritually speaking, in spiritual maturity, we, we know we can't keep looking behind us, but we keep striving forward. So we've got this image of, of a race. And a great reminder that we have here that it's not about what we've done in our past, that our identity, what we have now, is not what lies behind us, but our identity is, is who we are in Christ. See, Paul doesn't dwell on his past, but he strains forward to what lies behind. And I like this picture of this phrase of straining forward. In Greek, it's the word stretching forward. So just you got this, 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 this image for me, and it was just stretching forward as far as they can. It's reaching out, focused on what's in front of them. And Paul uses this picture for that. That, that yeah, I, I got this, I forget my past, but I, but I just stretch and I reach forward. And this is what Paul wants them to see here. There's a reason why we, we push and there's this and strain. Paul says it's because there's a goal. Paul says in verse 14 that he presses on to the goal for the prize. And the prize, the ultimate prize is, is knowing Jesus. That's the prize here. So Paul is saying is that he has to keep going. I have to press on. Do you guys know the, the fable, maybe the kids of the tortoise and the hare? Do you guys know that story, the tortoise and the hare? It's, it's almost like this. You know what happens in the tortoise and the hare, right? The, 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 the tortoise gets challenged to a race. So the, the, the rabbit, this hare, is like super fast. And he's like, hey, man, I bet, you know, want to have a race? I bet you I can beat you in a race. Am I giving it away? Am I spoiling it for anybody? If you're, if you're here, just cover your ears because I'm going to spoil it. The, this, uh, this fable. You might know the story. Okay, so, so they start this race, right? And so this, this tortoise... 
uh, just starts off, and he's slow, but he's, but he's slow and steady. He's just slowly plodding along, just moving, and the, and the, the, the rabbit, the hare, just shoots forward and gets so far ahead, and he's really far ahead, man. He thinks, this tortoise guy, look at him. So he, he stops. He takes a nap, and he just rests because he thinks he's got it in the bag. But what happens? You guys remember what happens in the story? What happens? The, the, the tortoise keeps going, yeah. The tortoise eventually passes the hare, and it's getting toward the finish line, and maybe the crowd starts cheering, and then the, the, the hare wakes up, and he's like, what is going on? He races forward, but, but he loses the race. The, 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 the tortoise, the slow and steady tortoise, wins, but he won because the hare stopped the race in the middle of the race and just took a break and just rested. Now, I use this illustration to remind us that of our need as a church, as need as followers of Jesus to keep going. Let's, we don't, let's not stop and take a break. Let's not rest for a while, but let's keep pressing on and striving on. In verse 15, Paul says, if we were mature in Christ, this is how we should think. That maturity, spiritual maturity as believers, we realize that we need to keep moving forward. We can't stop, we can't rest in anything that we have done, but we press forward. So Paul is writing this letter to the church, and he's telling them, he's asking them to join me, guys, in, just in, in, in pursuing Jesus above everything else. He doesn't leave any, any room for excuses. And he says, actually, if you don't agree with this, my, then his hope was that, that God would change their mind. That this is spiritual maturity, is striving forward. So the goal of this, of pressing on, is to be more like Jesus, to be Christ-like. And it doesn't apply to just leaders in the church. It doesn't just apply to super Christians, maybe that you know. This is the goal of all believers. So if you're a, a follower of Jesus, this should be your goal as well, to keep pressing forward, to become Christ-like, to become like him. So church, let's, let's keep pressing on. Let's look at the next few verses, verses 17 to 19. Paul says this, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So, first, let's look at first. Uh, let's look at what Paul is calling them. We, we looked at what Paul was calling them to do, and that was to strive forward. And this is the second point that we want to bring out. Paul is calling them to to imitate him. So this is imitating our second point. Paul is calling the church to join in imitating and what he does. So what we have seen so far in this passage is this call to strive and to, to press forward with the goal to become like Jesus. Since Paul's focus is entirely on this goal, this is what he was striving for. He considers everything else, we saw this, uh, I think it was last week, everything else was rubbish, right? So everything else he says was, was, uh, was rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. So he keeps us focused on striving for Jesus and now he's calling on the church to imitate him or to follow what he is doing. And one thing we see is that for Paul, his, his best teaching tool wasn't just these letters that he wrote. I think they were an important part of it, but also a very important part of Paul's teaching was his life, was the life that he lived. There were, there were likely a few at this church that he's writing this letter to. He's writing this church to a, the people in, in Philippi, the city, there were likely people in that church that had met Paul before when he planted the church. They, they knew Paul. They knew how he lived when he was with them. So he can, he can appeal to his own example as a model for how they should live, how the readers have lived. They've seen firsthand how he, he loved Jesus, how his focus was on the gospel. So he can appeal to that. But even, even, even in that even in them, Paul calling them to, to imitate him, what he's actually doing is he's just calling them to imitate Christ. 
See, this is actually who he's calling on them to imitate in another letter that Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Look, look what he says, and I think this is so important for us to understand what he's calling them really to do here. He says this, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It's not like just follow me, everything I do, but, but he's calling on them, yes, follow me, but, but follow me as I follow Jesus. That's the point here that he wants to get. He knows he's not perfect, right? He's, he's actually said this, said this in verse 12, that I haven't obtained this yet. So it's not about arrogance. It's not like, hey, look at me and follow everything I'm doing. It's not this arrogance here, but it's all about just following Jesus. But it's not just Paul that he's saying. It's not just me to watch, right? He's telling them there's also others you can watch too. He tells the Philippians to, to look to the example of other godly people. He says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He is telling that anyone else who behaves in this way, in the same way, he's like, I'm not your exclusive example of what it looks like to follow Jesus. So follow them. So for us as believers, we can know that we can be an example to others of how to press on, how to strive on. We can be that example. So now we have this call to, to imitate Paul as he imitates Jesus. And what he is doing is he's striving after Jesus. As he's striving after Christ. And now we have this, this warning in verses 18 and 19. Paul gives this warning. Now, there's some different views of this. Um, but I think that this warning is what happens when we stop striving. That's my, my interpretation of it. When we stop striving after Jesus, when we get, can get stale. So this is what happens when we get stale. Because in the context of this whole passage, he's telling a church to press on, right? To, 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 to strive forward. And now verse 18 and 19, he gives us uh, this warning of what happens when we don't. I'm going to read it for you again. Verse 18 and 19 say this. For many of whom I have often told told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ their end is destruction their god is their belly they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things now there is a bit of a debate on what Paul is talking about here is he talking about these these Judaizers who just follow the law really closely and demand that everybody everybody does they got to follow the law just like they do Others say maybe, no, no, it's, he's actually just talking about non-believers in, in general. And some thought he was talking about this. There's this group of, of, of liberal Christians who, though they maybe had expressed a, a, a belief in, in God maybe at one point, but they, they, they believe that they were totally righteous already, that they were saved so they can go ahead and live their life however they wanted. So there's these three kind of groups that there's a bit of a debate on who Paul was talking about. Now, I, I'm leaning toward the, the liberal believers that Paul is talking to here. This is who I think he's talking to. Now, there even may have been some of them in the church that Paul is writing, then, writing this letter to. But Paul, as he writes this letter, he, he's warned them about people like this before. So here again, he wants them, he warns them and says, and he does it now with tears. See, this breaks his heart. He, he, I think he knows some of these people, right? So it just breaks his heart to see this happening. These, these aren't his enemies. Even as they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, these are people who are, who are drifting away. So Paul is saying with tears, basically saying, I, I wish you guys would repent. I wish you would return. I wish you would strive to know Jesus. Instead, he says, the end is destruction, their God is their belly. By saying that, he's just saying that they, they follow all of their own desires. The lusts of their flesh tell them what to do. They follow their desires instead of following Jesus. This is that group of people that Paul, that's what he's talking about. Paul is saying here, look, like this is, their end is destruction. And he's like, I'm warning you guys, I'm pleading with you, don't go that route. Right? So he says, I've given you an example, and there's other godly people who have given you this example of who to follow. So now you have a choice. Are you going to follow us as we strive for Jesus, or are you going to follow this other group of people? 
See, there's other group of people we can see what their end is going to be like. Paul says their end is destruction. And now, if we look at our last two verses, we're going to see what the end is for the ones who, who strive and who press on. So he doesn't only warn the Philippians, he doesn't just um, use it to employ fear, maybe to motivate them, but there's a, a promise that he's going to give. There's a, there's a hope that he's going to give them that they can attain. And it's the final thing that he says in these last verses. He reveals what he's talking about. Finally reveals the hope toward which we are pressing towards. Look at these last two verses, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. See, these last verses just bring out my, uh, bring out my last point, and that's waiting. See, Paul is telling us that as we, we strive for Jesus, as we press on and we strive forward, we do so waiting for a Savior. He says that if you're a citizen of heaven, that is in a sense that's, that's where we, we belong. That if you're a follower of Jesus, that you realize that this world is not your home. See, just like the city of Philippi was a, a colony of, of Rome. See, when people would come and they would, they would visit there, they would probably see little reminders in, in Philippi that reminded them of, of Rome, of, of where, where it belonged. In, in the same way, Paul is telling the Philippians that the church, in a way, is a, is a colony of the kingdom of heaven. It's part of the kingdom of heaven. So if you're a follower of, of Jesus, the way we live, the way we do things, should point people to that. We should be giving the world a glimpse of our heavenly citizenship. And even in a way that people should look at a believer and maybe even say, man, like, why would you do that? Why, why do you live like that? Or, or why do you give so much? Why do you serve so much? Why do you keep loving so much? Why do you keep doing that? I mean, you're not from here, are you? The citizenship we have as followers of Jesus should reflect, it needs to reflect in how we live. There was a time, and I'm not sure if it's still like this, where if you were uh, um, traveling abroad as a Canadian, you would proudly put a Canadian patch on the back of your backpack or a, a hoodie or on your sleeve or whatever, right? So when you were traveling around, people would know that you're a Canadian. And, and the, the truth is, there was a, a lot of pride that came because when people from other countries saw you as a Canadian, they would treat you differently because... You weren't an American, you were a Canadian, right? So even Americans started putting Canadian patches on their stuff because they would get treated better. But because Canadians were, had a certain respect around the world. In the same way, as followers of Jesus, are, are we living in a way that people can just see that citizenship? Are we living in a way that points them to something different? As we just read, there are... Um, the, these bad examples, when Paul gave these examples of who to follow, there was this bad example of those who just followed their, their bellies, followed their own desires. And they, they had their minds, Paul says, focused on earthly things. But faithful examples, faithful examples, godly examples, live in light of their true citizenship. There's a quote. I didn't put it on the screen this week, but listen to this quote. This is from C.S. Lewis. In his book, Mere Christianity, this is what he says. It's really interesting. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since that Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. See that? We stop thinking about where we belong and we become ineffective in this world. It's with this citizenship as followers of Jesus that we wait for our Savior. At the beginning of this letter, 
in chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said this. He says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it on to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. There's a day that's coming where we will be complete. Paul says, I haven't obtained this yet. This is the day that he's talking about. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to press on. I'm going to push on until I'm there, until I get it. This is what we wait for. So Paul says that our, our lowly bodies will be transformed. In the King James, it says our vile bodies. That's just a descriptive word. Our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. What an incredible transformation is going to happen. To go from something vile, from something lowly, to something glorious. And like That's a transformation. Do you ever watch those home improvement shows? Right? Where they, people come in there and they buy this like rundown garbage house, right? That's just full of mold and everything like that. Like in one hour later, it's like, it's like miraculous. Like it's like a whole different house. It looks perfect, right? It's a, there's this transformation that takes, I know it's more than an hour. For TV, it's an hour or half an hour. But there's this amazing transformation to look at the house, at the finished product of it. You couldn't even tell it's the same house. See, our transformation as followers of Jesus from these vile bodies to these glorious ones is, is, is even greater than that. So this is what's going to happen when Jesus returns. That our bodies, Paul says, are going to be like his glorious body. Paul has talked about this in his passage and as he presses on toward the goal to win the prize. Guys, this is the prize. This is what the goal is. This is the prize. These glorious bodies. Christian maturity is about growing in Christ's likeness. And the fulfillment of this will finally happen when Jesus returns. So as Paul writes this letter, and in this part of the letter, part of the letter he's telling the church, church to strive forward. Just, just keep pressing on, keep pushing forward, pressing on. Look for godly examples of who to follow. Look for people you can follow as we all do this, and we do this all, we wait to be transformed. So we do this while we wait for him to come back. See, that's the goal. That's why we don't stop. That's why we don't take a nap before the finish line. <clears throat> There's so much hope in following Jesus. All the striving will be worth it. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah. As we strive forward, there's going to be times when it's hard. When we, we feel like giving up, we're going to want to give up. Because it's going to be so hard. Maybe we want to follow our own desires. Just for a while, right? Just, just follow them for a while. But when we see what is to come, when we see the hope that is coming, it makes all this pressing on, everything else striving forward worthwhile. <clears throat> so church, let's strive together. Let's strive and press on toward that goal, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, waiting for a savior, waiting to be transformed. And what a glorious time that will be. That's, that's where our focus is. That's where our focus needs to be and how wonderful it will be to say, just like John said in Revelation, Revelation 22, verse 20, the, almost the last verse of the whole Bible. Come, Lord Jesus. That we, we long for that. We long to attain that, to finally attain that. We can say that we have attained it. We have reached it. So let's strive forward. Let's, let's press on. Let's encourage each other to press on. Let's, let's live as examples of that. Let's show the world where our citizenship lies. And let's do that as we wait for Jesus to come. How glorious that will be. We will be transformed to be like him. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, for your word, for the encouragement that we see. God, would you help us to strive? As, 
Help us to strive forward when we want to give up and we want to turn around and look back. Would you help us to keep our eyes focused on you, to keep looking forward, knowing that we wait for you to come back or we will be transformed. What a glorious day that will be. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Amen.